birthday. Happy anniversary. You look good for 61 years old. Wow, you look good. You don't, don't look a day over 61. It is good to be back in the house today. Uh, I am back in the ATL. Uh, Pastor Brandy is back and re is still recovering. Yeah. Thank you for your prayers. Everything went well. We thank God for traveling mercies, traveling graces. And uh, also that we have another guest in the house this morning. Carlton Demetrius Pearson is in the house today. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. This is the day the Lord has made. We came to rejoice and be glad in it. Will you just help me this morning? God, we thank you. Thank you for life and health and strength. God, we thank you today for 61 years, God, of love and inclusion and whosoever will and modeling a message of the divine love of God in, through, and as all of us. God, we thank you for 61 more years. The good work you began in us, you'll see it to the day of perfection. Of course, in the name and nature of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. Don't touch anybody, but just look at them and tell them, you're looking good. You're looking good. You're looking good. Yeah.
So I, every Harvest Sunday, I feel the need to announce and make sure everybody knows I was not here on the, when the, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not as old as the church is, basically is what I'm trying to say. I, I came along some years later. So the Harvest Sunday, we as humans, we have this wonderful capacity for memory, a smell, a song, a sound, an object that we see can take us right back to something and we can just be in that place and time again. And I remember when my brother had written the book, I Don't Know the Way of Knowing, and he asked me to write the introduction for it. And in that introduction, I was talking about the fact that I, I'm pretty sure that over our lives, he and I had spent as many, if not more, hours on the property of the, this church, no matter what property it's been at over the years, we've spent as much or more time on the church property as we have at home or anywhere else. So for us, and for my mom and dad as well, <clears throat> this has become or is our second home. And it is literally a sanctuary, which we, sometimes we just say words and we don't think about what they really mean, but sanctuary is a place of rest. It's a place of safety. It's a place of peace. And I know that so many of you have made this your home, your sanctuary as well. So today, um, rather than responsibly reading back and forth, because it, it, when you, sometimes when you're reading a history or just a lot of facts, uh, it doesn't flow well to go back and forth between the congregation and the pastor. So today, I just, I'm going to read a little bit of the history of this place that we call home, and it's called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. As we celebrate the 61st anniversary our, of our church today, let us be happy for our connection to the past. Spirit and Truth Sanctuary would not be what it is today without Martin Luther King Jr., Earl Polk Sr., Earl Polk Jr., Don Polk, Carlton Pearson, and all open-minded teachers who have paved the way for us. Our ministry, which began in 1960 in downtown Atlanta, embarked on the mission of creating an interracial church in the heat of the civil rights movement in the South, which was not the wisest decision for church growth. Yet, the idea of having an inclusive church and a diverse spiritual community was stronger than any force attempting to kill the dream before it had time to become a reality. As the name of the church changed from Gospel Harvester Tabernacle to Chapel Hill Harvester Church, the Cathedral at Chapel Hill, the Cathedral of the Holy Spirit, and finally, Spirit and Truth Sanctuary, the mission and message became broader and bolder. From racial harmony, to interdenominational openness, to women's rights, to LGBTQ inclusion, and now to interfaith unity, the idea that all God's children are welcome and wanted. Spirit and Truth Sanctuary has now become the most inclusive and progressive expression of God's kingdom in Atlanta. Experiencing the love of God above the segregations of race, gender, sexual orientation, and religions is the realization of a dream that began 61 years ago. You can see far when standing on the shoulders of giants. As we navigate our journeys using the wisdom of the lessons our beloved ancestors left us, we are bestowing upon them the highest of honors. Today, our senior pastor says to us, sharing this sacred miss mission, message, and mandate with you, the Congregation of Spirit and Truth Sanctuary is the highest honor and the greatest privilege of my earthly journey, and we've only just begun. Every day that I live is a gift from God. As I honor each day, each moment, each breath, I, we, are consciously living in gratitude for Spirit and Truth Sanctuary. And so it is. Amen. Appropriate that we sing this song together today. I'm not sure there has ever been a song written that is more um, 
apropos to who we are at Spirit of Truth Sanctuary. We are a place of restoration, a house of whosoever will. The idea of that has just been broadened over the years and decades. And so enjoy this song. Take a big, deep breath. Let it just soak into your pores. <laughs> this is who we are right here. Just let it be an organic moment of just some, some sense of peace and joy, light, love. Just let it be part of who you are. Amen. Mm -hmm. This house shall be called a place of restoration, a place where the broken are made whole. Healing water flows and mercy abounds here. Abides here, saith the Lord. Come on, help us sing this house. This house shall be called a place of restoration. Come on, believe it and forsake. A place where the broken will be. for just a second. God, we thank you for restoration, for keeping power. God, for love, for joy, for light, for life. God, we know the things that uh, have seemed against us have all worked together for our good. God, we wouldn't give anything for our journey this morning. 
we can look back over our lives <laughs> and see how you ordered each and every step. God, we give you thanks today. Thank you today for the good work you began in us. We give thanks. Our hearts are full of gratitude and thanksgiving on this moment, God. Thank you for 61 years of a message, of a mission, of a ministry, of a mandate, of a model. We give thanks today for it's in the name and nature of Jesus the Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. You may be seated in the house. Amen, amen, and amen. seated 80 
83 years young, still playing like that. Can you say amen to that? Look at God. Look at God. Well, welcome to Spirit and Truth Sanctuary. If this is your first time, whether you're in the building, whether you're joining us virtually, we certainly are glad uh, that you're here. You're at the right place at the right time. We believe God has ordered your steps. Whether you say in your heart that you've been to church too many times or too many churches or said, I've never been to church and never, never going to go back. Ne I don't, I'm not interested. However you landed here today, you're in the right place at the right time. You are going to hear from an incredible voice today. I can promise you this. You're going to get all the food that you want and then some. Everybody's going home with, with, uh, with a doggy bag today. You're going to get fed well in this house today. We're so glad Bishop Pearson is in the house with us on our 61st anniversary. I would guess that probably of the past 20 anniversaries, I think about 19 of them you have been here. Seriously, I, I think 19 of the last 20 years Bishop Pearson has been here with us. And so we're very, very glad for that. Uh, I did want to say uh, a special thank you to those who kind of helped to hold things down while Brandy and I were out of town. And uh, just so very grateful uh, for that. Uh, Pastor Lonnie, uh, Brandy and I were up early on the West Coast watching him preach an amazing message two weeks ago. Thank you, Pastor Lonnie. Unbelievable. LaDonna holding down the fort, all of our staff, our ministry team, just everybody holding hands. Thank you so much for helping to hold it down. How many of you have been part of our daily devotional, the Fully Awake Daily? Look at all these hands. We're getting up early. We're drinking our water, stretching, getting our mind right, taking some deep breaths. This morning's um, uh, lesson, amen, somebody, this morning's lesson was from none other than Bishop Carlton D. Pearson. He blessed us this morning with a wonderful word. Tomorrow, we, we will uh, begin again with our uh, daily devotion. We're sending out an email. It just has several different links. You can connect through Zoom. You can connect through YouTube. You can, you can literally dial in uh, on your way to, to work. You can stick your phone, just lis listen in on the, on the conversation. It only lasts about 10 minutes. We are through, I think, 10 days of the 100 days. Uh, we're going to walk into 2022 very, very, very powerfully. And uh, tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's uh, prayer or devotional is one of my favorite in, in all 100 days. It's called the senility prayer. Anybody familiar with the senility prayer? I know y'all looking at me like, you mean the serenity prayer? No, the, I'm saying it right, the senility prayer. That means God help me forget everybody that I hate. Amen, somebody. Help me to get them out of my life, vibrate them, however you want to say it, vibrate on away, sashay away, whatever you do. Thank you. I got a, I got a witness from somebody's been watching RuPaul's Drag Race in this house. Amen. Yeah. Tomorrow is going to be a, the way you want to start your day. Take that email, forward it to some friends, say, hey, start the day off right with us. And so we're so glad. The books are still available. Uh, they're sell really, really selling well, fully awake, the Holy Bible of Inclusion, and uh, also I Don't Know the Way of Knowing. You can get those today in person. You can order them on Amazon. You can download them as an ebook on your Kindle, your iPad. We give thanks for all, for all of that wonderful information uh, that is going out. And so continue to join us with that. A couple of uh, birthday shouts out today on this 61st anniversary. Miss Naomi Harris, one of the most precious ladies in this house. Happy birthday. Yeah. I don't know if she's in the house, but Sylvia Garrett has been here for so many years. Happy birthday, Sylvia. Uh, Chris Promise, Jared Doe, happy, happy birthday. Karen Davenport, wow, look at all these amazingly involved members. Karen run, helps to run our children's ministry. Um, both Beverly and Jimmy Valerie, we give thanks for the Valerie family this morning. Kim Mahone, uh, John Lippett, that's uh, Ra uh, Rachel's father. Uh, Caleb uh, Buchanan, Sheila Warner, Miami Wallace, happy birthday to everybody. Celebrate you, you certainly, uh, certainly deserve it. A quick thank you for everybody who came out to our work day yesterday. Uh, we got a lot accomplished. I came up this morning. I saw new pine straw. Some weeds have been taken care of. The building inside looks great. Thank you for the work that you've done. While, while we're saying thank you to work day, we haven't had a work day in 18 months. And uh, Brandy and I got back Friday night. My goodness, our plane landed about 1 o'clock in the morning. We didn't get home and settled down into bed until about 4. You know, when you have surgery, it's just difficult to get get comfortable and pain and med medications all day. So went to bed at four. Um, we woke up one time between four and six. Um, and then at, at six, got up, tried to get everything repositioned for our devotion. I called Randy. I said, Randy, I don't think I've ever missed a church work day in my life, but I ain't coming. Tell him I'm, I'm somewhere else. I'm, the Lord raptured me away. I'm in a seventh heaven. 
I am not, I'm taking my white ass back to sleep. Amen, somebody. I'm exhausted. God, gonna, God is good all the time. Amen. And those of you who came and worked in my absence, thank you. Thank you for, for your, I, I probably will never miss another one. These were special circumstances. We thank you for the work that you did uh, yesterday. While we're saying thank you for those who did, uh, came to the church work day yesterday, I want to say thank you for someone who has a church work day 52 weeks a year and keeps our grass cut, keeps us looking good. Scott Palmer, will you wave at us in the back? Thank you, Scott, for everything that you do. Yes. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to just uh, have, uh, if, if you will, Dad, come and join us on stage, if you will. This is, it is our anniversary, but it's also known in some churches as Founders Day. And I want Dad to just come and say a word. And Mama, if you will come stand with me. LaDonna, if you'll come stand with us. I would have Brandy come. I don't, I don't think you want to make it up those steps. I think you want to stay right there today. I get it. Yeah. Come on, Mom, if you will. And 83 years young, 61 years in full-time ministry. Yeah. I am so overwhelmed today. It's really hard not to cry. But I'm so grateful to God. When I was a little girl, I begged God to give me a minister for a husband and let me live in one place in one church till I was able to teach children and people all about the arts and worship. And God answered my prayer. And I want to thank every one of you, everyone that's here today, everyone that was here in the past that has made this ministry possible. We have not done it. You have done it. We just followed what God said, and you supported it with your prayer, with your tithes, with your attendance, you're with your attendance to rehearsals. I can't say thank you enough. I love you. It's dangerous to turn an old man loose with a lot of memories. And I do have a lot of memories. I remember when Clarice and I, we got uh, married shortly after the church was established in October. And uh, we married in December. And we married on a Friday night, came to Atlanta, set up housekeeping in a little apartment, and uh, went to church on Sunday, and we've been here ever since. But I thought th th there are several directions we could have taken with this church. But I was thinking this morning of sitting with my brother at the table, and we were talking about, this was in the early 60s, and we were talking about what direction shall we go? This is a time when most of the churches in Atlanta, the ushers were stationed at the door. And if you were of the wrong color, you didn't come in. They stopped you. So we, we sat down and we said, now, which direction are we going? Are we going to do like all the other churches in Atlanta, or are we, are we going to go in a different direction? And we decided then, let's go in a different direction. We got in our car, drove across the railroad tracks. We were the nearest church to Ebenezer Baptist Church. We went over and said, can we find Daddy King? At that time, he was doing the pastoring, and Martin was out on the road. And we found him. And we said, uh, Dr. King, we want to become involved in the civil rights struggle. Uh, what shall we do? He said, you be here Saturday morning in the basement, and we have breakfast here with, with concerned clergy. And we came, he and I, and one other uh, Episcopal priest, uh, Austin Ford, were the only three white people there. And I never will forget sitting across from Dr. King. He had his glasses down on the end of his nose, had a deep voice, and he looked at us and he said, Boys, are you ready to go to jail with me? Well, that's, that frightened me. Uh, but as a result, we became involved with, with the civil rights struggle. And it set the tone for this church, which became a whosoever will church, a church of inclusion. And so there are many other members, but I can remember the different places that we have been, the different buildings we have been in. But I want you to know we are right where God wants us now. We are in the middle of his will. We're not the biggest church in Atlanta, but we are the church in Atlanta. As someone said earlier today, 
It is making a statement that nobody else is making. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for so many things, but among the things that I'm grateful for, of course, I'm grateful for Clary. She is, she's my, she's my mentor, my tutor, uh, whatever I need, she, she is that. But I especially wanted to say thank you to my kids. Now, to me, they're still little kids, and I remember when they were little, but I look at them now, and uh, uh, D.E. is big and ugly, and uh, and Ladonna is she's 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 gorgeous and wonderful. <laughs> but uh, to see them taken over as the pastors of this church, along with Brandy and the other members of the family and the other uh, staff members, is so rewarding to me. So many churches I can I have thought of and watched across the years that when the founder died. The church died. But now this church is going on as strong as ever. We might not have everybody, but the message that we are setting forth here is the most in, important message on the face of this globe. It is the only message that will save the planet. Trust me on that. So, and I want to finally say thank you to you, you who has been faithful, th those of you who have been here through thick and thin, especially during the pandemic, you have been faithful, and we are so grateful for every one of you. So today on this special day, thank you for everything that you have done, and I love every one of you. And uh, again, thank you, Pastor D.E., for your, your work. Amen. LaDonna just pulled a, amen, yeah. I looked at LaDonna, I said, you want to say this? She said, I've already said it. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> That's a, that's a Don Pauk move right there. Everything that has been said, it could be said, has already been said. Will you just give thanks to God for 83 years of life and ministry and love and inclusion? Yeah. Can you imagine a 22-year-old 20, fresh out of college, young white man in the South, walking into Ebenezer Baptist Church and being told, let's go to jail together. Can you imagine the courage that this man had that set the trajectory of this church? We didn't just become LGBTQ plus affirming and interfaith inclusive overnight. It started 61 years ago when a 22 year old, this is the true story, said we need to get involved. Our bishop became a civil rights icon, uh, will be remembered by that has, has streets named after him but his involvement in the civil rights movement if you want to know the behind the scenes story was at the impetus and insistence of his younger brother who was 22 years old young and crazy amen somebody <laughs> let's get involved let's go march let's <laughs> wow yeah. so, social justice began 61 years ago at this church because of that man right there. And so we give thanks uh, for that today. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. I did want to uh, recognize a, a few people. I want to say a special thank you today. Uh, I see I see Lizzie and Brendan uh, up at, up in the top. Thank you, guys. The Harris, the Harris family is represented by his, his Royal Highness. Dana Harris is in the house, my cousin, my brother. He held this ministry together for years and years, produced all of our television program, all of our outreach, and he still very much believes in what we're doing. My two children, will you stand? Esther, I want you to see my, my beautiful babies. I'm so proud of them and doing their thing. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful thing to leave, to leave your home for 15 days and to know that your children are going to behave and take care of things. They're going to take care of things. And so we owe you guys a, a, a nice dinner out. Thank you so much for, for your love. I wanted to say one more thank you, and that is to, uh, to, to Brandy, uh, who had a... a extremely invasive procedure uh, uh, just a few days ago, and two days, two days after her surgery, she is having to be helped up off of the couch, basically walked over to uh, the breakfast room table, and then getting her computer, getting us plugged into our daily devotional, putting a smile on her face, telling everybody good morning while she's sitting there in pain, 
needing pain medications, that takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of stamina, it takes a lot of strength, but most importantly, it takes a belief in your heart that we are preaching the right message, we are modeling the right mission, and I just wanted to say a special thank you as she's recovering for all of the labor and work, amen. All right, let's have, let's have some fun. Then I'm going to get out of the way and let Bishop Pearson take over. Some fun. All right. Uh, 54 years. 54 years of membership. And this is their first Sunday back in the house, really since COVID. Damon and Diane Patterson, will you wave at us? 54 years. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and then right, right behind them is the, the third piece of the Trinity right there behind them. Annette Eubanks has been a member here for 53 years. Happy anniversary. She is family to us. Amen. Will you do that? Will you wave at us if you've been here 40 years? Anybody 40 years? Look at these hands. Wow, 40 years. Am I seeing correctly? Am I seeing the right? Am I seeing Miss Winnie Maloon here, 93 years old, on our anniversary? <laughs> 93 years old. Look at this. Wow. How many have been here 30 years? Will you wave at us 30? Wow, look at this, 31. I hear people calling it out. You know when you join. Anybody 20 years? About 20 years? Yeah, look at those hands in the balcony. Okay, 10 years, anybody? A few people, yep, I see John. David Michael's like, yeah, you're, you're new. I've been here my whole life. My whole life I've been here. Anybody, uh, anybody five years? Five years or so? A few hands, yes. Miss Anita, yay, yay, yay. Anybody one year or, or so, one year, let's, yes, Miss Cheryl, our, our MVP, yes, yes. And the Turnbulls, not quite a year, but here for several months and feel like you've been here for a long time. Well, happy anniversary to our church. We love you guys uh, tremendously, and uh, the best is yet uh, to come. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All right. Let's all stand together, if you will. This is our time to present our tithe to the Lord. We do it in cheer, in joy, knowing that God loves a cheerful, not a fearful giver, a cheerful giver. God has given us the power to gain wealth that he may establish covenant with us. As we sow, we reap. As we act, there is the reaction. As we are, a, as we are blessed, we become a blessing for others. If you have your tithe this morning, I'll ask you to hold it up with me. And let's offer it to God. God, we thank you for the chance to give today. We give now in cheer, knowing that as blessing flows to us, it is flowing through us. God, as we seek first the kingdom of God. All other things are being added to us. God, thank you for your keeping power. Thank you for a strong church, for a financially solvent church. Thank you for every glad and giving heart in the house today. For it's in the name and nature of Jesus the Christ we pray. Can you all say amen? Amen. You may be seated.
for just a moment, if you will. I want to just give a brief introduction. A few weeks ago, I had to uh, complete a, a paper, uh, uh, an assignment at Emory, and the assignment was to present a saint um, and to talk about that saint, to offer um, uh, literary point of views, history, and there are several qualifications for sainthood, if you're familiar with uh, the process of becoming a saint. And there are more than I'll read today, but I chose, uh, I chose none other than Carlton Demetrius Pearson uh, to present as my living saint. And I, I just made a few comments about his life. One of the, one of the uh, things that you have to do to be, uh, to be uh, deemed a saint is you have to have a willingness to offer your life, to offer your life as a, as a living sacrifice. And that may not be specifically in our modern text, as, uh, as, a phys as a physical martyr. But when you think about what this man, <laughs> this spirit, has laid down in order to speak truth to power, in order to present to us a bigger and better vision and version of the awesome God of this universe, he has laid his life down in more ways than one. My daughter just a few days ago uh, was watching 
the Netflix movie Come Sunday, which is a movie, uh, it's an autobiographical movie, movie about the life and ministry of Carlton Pearson, uh, played by uh, none other than Chiwetel Ejiofor, um, an award-winning actor, uh, star-studded cast with uh, Lakeith Stanford, um, Stanfield, sorry, Jason Siegel, Martin Sheen, Danny Glover, just to name a few. Amazing story. But my daughter, who's only 22, she said, Dad, I never realized until I saw the movie. Carlton stays in our house. We eat together. We laugh together. He's family. But she said, you know, I've been so close to him growing up as a child with him, I didn't really realize who he was. I didn't really get a glimpse of the historical impact of this man that we call Uncle Carlton. And when she watched that movie, she was almost emotional. She said, I didn't, I had no idea the price that he's paid to walk away from the pinnacle of success. Can we talk about gospel Hollywood for just a minute today? Sometimes people want to keep the gravy train grow, going by preaching something they don't believe any longer in their pulpits. Amen. Yeah. A man who was the first nationally syndicated African-American Christian preacher on national television. This is historic. He was named as Oral Roberts' successor to Oral Roberts University. He uh, began the Azusa Conferences, the Azusa Music Ministry. Most people, if you're, if you're aware of Azusa, you also know that that Azusa stage is what launched Bishop T.D. Jakes into who he is today. This, this is an icon living with us. And I said in my, um, I said in my presentation that one of, the, uh, one of the areas I love about Bishop Pearson uh, is, was his ability to accept the burden, <laughs> the reproach, the albatross of birthing and, and producing a message that may not have been popular, but just sit back and give it some time. Just, just as my mama would say, just hide and watch. Just hide and watch. Watch and see 20 years from now if almost every pulpit in America is not preaching what this man has paid a price to birth in the earth. And so we give thanks for that. The last piece of it that I, that I presented was most saints have, uh, have a, a, a potential to produce a salvific effect on other people's lives, whether that be the laying down of their life, the preaching of the gospel in some way, the reconnecting to God and consciousness. I want to declare to you, in, uh, this is a class I'm taking, it's about 50 people, it's an ethics class. After I presented Carlton Pearson in my class, five of my, of my colleagues came to me and said, D.E., I'm I'm transgender. I'm a same gender loving. I'm from the LGBTQ plus community. When I heard Carlton Pearson accept us and that God's love was not asking us to change, to be delivered from some gay demon that God made me this way, this is who I am, I'm affirmed and loved by God, all of the suicidal thoughts I was having left my mind. Woo, that's powerful, very, very powerful. Bishop Pearson says a lot that today's heretic is tomorrow's hero. And so we're not going to wait until the battle's over. We're going to shout now and say we appreciate this man, we love this man, we honor, we respect this man. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's welcome Bishop Carlson Pearson today. around your precious cells and souls. <clears throat> Thank you, Donna. Oh. Eternal God, our mother and our father, we are grateful for the intelligence of the Holy Spirit, for the divine inclinations, the wisdom, peace, for the enlightenment of the soul and self, for the surrounding graces that help us breathe inhale and exhale truth and clarity. Thank you for divine provision and vision, for the incentives, for the intentions of the glory of God in us expressed with clarity. We dare to say yes to you. We surrender to our destiny. 
past, present, and future. And we connect with all that is. Infinite, natural, and yes, we bless you, great God, in, to, through, and as us, and all of the earth, thank you forever. Amen. And amen. Bless you, thank you, and be seated. This is not a church I go to on the planet, including the one I founded, which doesn't exist anymore. That embraces me pastorally and brotherly like this one. This is my church. I sit and try to stop crying, weeping. I think it's the older I get, the more I sensitive I get about sentimentalities. The parks are so precious to me. And um, I, I have a connection here that goes back to 1975 when John Mears, Bishop John, the late John Mears, introduced Clarice to me by bragging on her being his niece and how wonderful she was on the keyboards. And uh, I would meet her and meet the Polk family, the bishop, whom we greatly respect, love, regard, and revere, who founded the ministry here. And I go back to all those years, and most of the churches that invited me in those days have stopped or don't. In fact, all of them don't stop. <laughs> so coming here is like coming home. You're singing. I just love it. You sound better than ever. You look better than ever. You feel better than ever. And even though we had to do the social distancing and the wearing the masks, now you all know why people kept offering you gum. We've been forced to smell our own breath. I think the culture has been, in, has been forced to smell its breath. The country has been made to smell its breath. And there's been a problem with halitosis, uh, spiritual halitosis, truth decay. Talk to me, somebody. We need some orthodontist and orthodoxy. Ortho means to make straight. So I think there's a straightening occurring right now, and we're all a part of it. But it's always a joy to be at home. Thank you for your kind words. I didn't, uh, I, I consider D.E. Paul my number one spiritual son of inclusion and radical inclusion. He studied very carefully and listened to what I had to say. The bishop didn't fully grasp it at first, but he said, keep talking, son, keep talking, keep talking. And he put me in front of preachers, hundreds of them, and insisted that I speak, Bishop Earl Park. And even though they squealed and some of them were upset, he said, just tell it like it is. I'm learning too, I'm listening. He'd already been thinking these thoughts. I think Don Paul, before any of us, um, got it. He just, I think he came here with it. He's always been a radical. Somebody, uh, this man is a, spoken in my life when I first came here, more than the bishop. The bishop put me on the tennis court and ran me around and insulted me and beat me. And I was, I was so mad, not just because he won, he was old and won. And see, he challenged me to play tennis. I thought, oh, man, I, I ain't got no time for him. And he was very bold. We got out on the course, and I'm fairly good at tennis. And uh, plus, I'm young, black, and strong, and he's old, white, and wrong. And, and <laughs> that was, what, 1978 or something like that. So I, I, I was very humbled by that, but I've loved and respected him ever since. And... Uh, I just was, I felt his presence so much today. What LaDonna said in her opening comments were very touching to me. Whoa. You know, when you get a little older, you lose so many people. Every phone call, somebody's going. And sometimes they're siblings. My mother's 91. I put her, I tuck her in bed every night. Nobody can take better care of my mom than and I, I can't. And when my dad transitioned seven years ago, I invited her over one weekend. And uh, she was living in that big old house out in, in East Tulsa alone. And uh, so she didn't want to leave her house. I said, why don't you just come spend the one weekend with me? She came one weekend and never went back home, not even to pack. <laughs> She's been there six, seven, uh, four years. Won't even go back to pack. And we, we just, but I tuck her in myself. I make sure she has her boost every morning. She likes a little 
popsicles and I'll just do what she did to me and my other five siblings when we were little give us little pieces of candy and stuff like that and, and uh, you, you have to instruct them like their children almost and uh, but I love that I don't know how long I'll have her every time I come here I, I don't know how long I'll get when, when Clarice sits to the piano I get teary-eyed she's elegant and beautiful and 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 uh, eloquent and classy and that beautiful red outfit she's wearing today 83 years old you'd never know it. her I know her fingers are not as agile and I know she must feel a little pain arthritic pain when she runs them across the keyboard but I remember sitting up in the balcony when we first moved here and hearing her play we hadn't even fully moved in I just sat up there and sobbed I'm sentimental in that sense and uh, but they're very special we don't know how much longer we'll have them so celebrate them while you do hug on them and love on them and respect them and uh, you know that's the part about aging you don't you don't like as much so many of our pillars and pillows the people we laid our heads on their breasts are gone parents grandparents spiritually otherwise last two weeks ago Oral Roberts secretary of 60 years Ruth Brooks made her transition um, I used to go take her I personally picked her up in my car and drove her to see the movie come Sunday and of course I've kept in touch with her for 50 years and uh, she I know what hamburger she likes where she goes I would take things to her she had several strokes she couldn't speak very much the last time I went to see her but uh, you should take care of the people you love and make time take time create time and don't have I don't ever have regrets when somebody goes uh, if I if I know they're going I just touch them and love them and in these very delicate times we need to do that more than normal wouldn't you say amen to that amen. another round of applause for the pork pork, pork household and <laughs> Being in the home with D.E. and the children and Brandy, they're such a precious family. And that's, this is the only church or place in the world I go and speak and stay in the home and rather than a hotel. I stayed in the bishop's home for, for years. And uh, last time I went in the home and they were changing things around, he had made his transition. I could have barely make it up the steps for collapsing with, with uh, just the emotion of, uh, of what he meant to me. And he and Norma, we, I laid at the foot of his be bed many, many nights and let him just talk and share, and tell jokes and just watch television um, and funny stuff. And uh, you know, those are sacred moments you'll never have again. And so when you have them sentimentally, cherish them. 93 years old, they said, this precious saint is back here. 93 years young, I should say. Look at that, she, she, you, she, with that hat on and, and, and a little mask, you can't hardly tell. Look, I need a magnifying glass to find a wrinkle. Uh, she's sitting there by our stand-up. Uh, what's her name? What's the name? Winnie. Winnie. Look at there. I just want to see 93 years. My God. I've seen her several times, and, I, and when I come here, and she just keeps on coming. She's just a little, little older than the Holy Ghost, and I'm so glad. Did she? You want to say something? Give her a mic, please. She or she. In December, she'll be 94? 95. Wow. Wow. You must have. 95. Wow, 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 wow. We know Jesus spiritually. I think she knows him personally. <laughs> a real honor. Hattie Mae, right here in front. The Hattie Mae is Patrice Lovely. You've seen her on the Tyler Perry shows and Medea and all that stuff. She's sitting right here in the front. Fine as I, I didn't know she was that pretty. She, stand up and let the folks see. She, she just shows up this morning. I've never seen her outside of costume. Wow. Amazing. Um, a brilliant, bright, smart, intelligent, funny, spiritual lady. Met her years ago in Chicago when she, what, what um, circus, what do you call it? Uh, Universal Circus. She was the, uh, the, the ringmaster. I had never seen a female ringmaster in African American. She, she controlled that room, and that, it was thousands of people who had come to see uh, the circus, and there she was. And I didn't realize now she's elevated to a household name for so many people. I'm proud of you. Thank you for coming this morning. 
Always an honor. My godson, Sam, always drives me when I come. Uh, precious brother, love him very dearly. I want to talk for a few minutes. I really do have a, only a few minutes. I'm sort of, um, as you know, sentimental this morning. 60 is, is the number of, of uh, what we call a, the diamond jubilee. And diamonds are simply rocks that did well under pressure. It is the hardest stone that exists. Only a diamond could cut a diamond. And um, this church has entered into its diamond era. And the founder and founders um, would be very proud of where you're taking the church. Donnie, Donnie, uh, you, you are really an edgy, creative visionary with guts and truth you have such respect for truth, you can't ignore it. And every time I read one of his books or listen to him talk about, he's just expanding beyond what I have. And I am so impressed and so proud of who he is and his leadership, uh, his uh, humility, his graciousness. Now he's working on a PhD. Uh, this guy is off the chain. You're, you're blessed to have him as your servant leader here. And I've never seen more support from a wife than I have Brandy in all my years of ministry. She's so there, involved in this ministry, his ministry, in our lives, up with us early this morning, doing all that technical work. She's a genius. She fixes my phone, everything I need. She's been doing that for years. And uh, I'm just proud of all of you in the most meaningful ways. Part of the meaning of the number 60 is derived from the fact that it's considered the threshold of when a person enters uh, the last major phase of their lives. I'm 68. So I'm conscious of the fact that I have probably far less time in front of me than I do behind me. Uh, I've lived a great life. I don't have any regrets. If I was to be taken and transitioned, I wouldn't have any regrets. I've lived my best life and I continue to do that. But in these days, at these days, I'm sort of um, philosophical and I do a lot of psychology and thinking and reflecting. And I think we all do in this country because we've been going through this major shift uh, the last several years. It's something I've never experienced in my nearly seven decades, and it doesn't seem to stop. Never, the, the number one virus in America today is distrust. People don't know who to trust. They don't even know what to trust or if to trust. There's so many voices out there. By the rivers of Babylon, Psalm of Exile, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. They were in exile, but they were not weeping because of exile. They weren't reaping because of of being in Babylon. They were, they were weeping because they had a memory of Zion. When we remembered Zion, Hebrew, Zion, uh, which means sign or way marker or uh, signal or significance. As long as you remember your significance, you're going to be all right. You get confused when you forget why you're here and you forget why you came. Where are we? Understanding the times and knowing what the church or the enlightened, the word church that Jesus uses is the word ecclesia, which we ek meaning out of classes to be called out of darkness or obscurity into marvelous illumination. That's what that really means. It has nothing to do with the physical building. He didn't use the word kuriakos in Greek, which means assembly or congregation. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my ecclesia. Those who hear the summons or the call or the invitation, what? do you hear? What are you listening to? Or what are you making a list of in your consciousness? Faith cometh by hearing. You've heard me say that many times, akuo, acoustics. And you hear sounds, echos in Greek, echo in English, a sound out of the past. Something, a sound you made when you entered this planet. Your soul made a sound. Your soul sent out a signal. Your soul knew its significance. We're all experiencing PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Much of it started as we passed down through the birth canal, the trauma after having swam or tread water for six, for nine months in our mother's womb, hearing all the vibrations of her emotions and commotions and devotions, Coming here, suddenly, nine months, everything begins to shift. The organs in the body begins to shift. The water breaks. You slide down that 
that uh, birth canal pop out on a table. There's a bright light in your face. You've never seen it before. And suddenly you're traumatized. And we spend the rest of our life trying to walk through the post-traumatic stress syndrome of being a human being uh, who afflicted with the sexually transmitted disease our parents gave us called life. <laughs> the dis-ease or dis-ease, the tension of life, what we go through. What do we do with this sacred trust we've been given called life? David's men, when, when, when the time came, came time for David to became, become king of Israel, the, after Saul, people sensed it. And they began to gather around him. And I won't read the whole passage because I don't have time, but there were large numbers, six, eight hundred, all, all the way up to 72,000, 20,000 at one time. But the smallest group was the, the tribe of Issachar, only 200 chiefs or captains. They understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Turn to somebody and say, understanding the times, I know what I should do, I think. Let's talk about the certainty of being uncertain or the uncertainty of being certain. <laughs> First of all, we're not in trouble. I've said it a hundred times. We're in transition. Say it. I'm not in trouble. I'm in transition. Which means, and I've said this repeatedly the last several years, the universe is cleaning, clearing, and correcting itself. And everything that's happening on the planet is a part of that clearing, cleaning, and correction. The universe knows who she is and what she, why she exists, and she knows how to fix herself. So all we have to do is manage the uncertainty of trying to be certain about whatever you're certain. If I ask you, what do you really know? You'd probably say, I don't know what I really know. All I know is that I don't know enough I don't know the same things I believe, and I don't believe the same things I know. Most people know what they believe, but they don't believe what they know. If I ask you what's the difference between what you know and what you believe, you might have to struggle for a few minutes to figure out what I just asked you. What do you know that you don't believe? And what do you believe that you absolutely know? And do you absolutely know anything? And do you absolutely believe anything? Faith is faith is, is uh, functional, but it's not always factual. Truth is not static. Truth shifts and changes. Sh truth is not stagnant. It moves like water. It evolves. The fact is, you're here right now. In an hour, the fact will have changed. You won't be here. The fact is, some of you are hungry right now. That fact can change soon as you eat. Or when nobody's looking, put a little piece of candy in your mouth. In fact, go ahead and do that now and rest your mouth. No, I'm kidding. For a mat. <laughs> Uncertainty refers to situations involving uh, imperfect, incomplete, inaccurate, or unknown information. And we're filled with that today. Quests and questions and questionings and requests and inquests and inquiries, in effect. What are the requirements we're saying? What? is expected of me. What do I do next? How do I manage these, these um, uncertainties? Many people are losing sleep. The suicide rate is up. Insomnia is up. Substance abuse, alcohol and drugs are up. Runaways are up. Divorce is up. Abuse of spouses, abuse of children, self-abuse is at its highest in our country. People don't know from the White House to the, the dog house. And sometimes you can't tell the difference between the two, at least uh, b before Biden got it all. <laughs> don't let me get political in here. So what's next? Where do we go from here? We seem to be in between seasons, or more accurately, at the beginning of a new one. I was born halfway through the last century, 1953. I'm 20, almost 22 years into the next century and the newest millennium. I don't know how much longer I'll have, but probably I'll live cl probably close to my 90s, only because I'm part of the midwivery of helping to birth a new spiritual paradigm. I believe that, that I'm supposed to help, not birth it, but help birth a shift in consciousness. This church is a part of that. It's the way you have to look at yourself. Part of you... The, the, Spirit and truth is just that, spirit, essence, 
and truth, which is certainties. What are you certain about? Our English word tree and true, the, the English word truth and tree are connected because trees were considered reliable, had deep roots. The first meals that humans ate, according to scripture, came from trees and truths. In fact, God is quoted of saying in the New Old Testament, all the trees or truths in the garden are good, except the one that says any of the other ones aren't. Did you hear that? Yeah. All the trees or truths in the garden are good, except the one in the middle that suggests that, there is the, that, that something might be wrong with one of the other ones. We didn't know how to handle the dual consciousness of right and wrong. Because what may be right or wrong to you may not necessarily seem right or wrong in the divine realm. We're talking from an earthly point of view. A lot of us don't know how to handle the dual consciousness that we all wrestle with every day. What do we do next? Where do we go from here? How do we find ourselves? Shift happens. You've heard me say that many times. And I'm here this morning to help you get and keep your shift together because we all trying to keep our, get our shift. To turn to somebody, get your shift, S-H-I-F-T. Get it together. I know mother said, what did he say? Look at her, she's looking all around. Is, is anybody here with her? She shook her head. <laughs> My mother said, spell it, boy. Every time you tell that, spell it. But we're trying to handle who, this is one of the main reasons this ministry from the Chapel Hill, what was the name before Chapel Hill that you mentioned? Gospel Harvest. Gospel Harvest. From Gospel Harvest to the day, Spirit and Truth. That's what's existed and lasted for over six decades. This ministry, in fact, it was birthed out and in spite uh, of, um, of and in response to a harsh, classical, Pentecostal doctrine and dogma that was crippling to the founders. I don't think Don ever completely submitted to the crippling. He's always been a free spirit. He's always been a, a radical. Even when I first met him, he, he taught me not to take myself or my ministry too seriously. He made me confront practicalness. In his own quiet way, he would just say things. And then when I read what he said about us, he, he complimented in, in the newsletter that he was, he was editing in those days. I'm talking about 1978, I think it was. Well, I read it. My, my staff read it. We were leaving the church. Uh, we were on the road, and the newsletter came out a week or so after we were there. And I read what he said. I wish I had have kept it. It was the most encouraging words I read 40 years ago about this ministry. He understood and had a grasp on it. That's why he can sit in church and sleep, because he, he understands. <laughs> He's got this. He, I can't tell him that he don't already know. I don't ever get offended. I just wish I could crawl up there and sleep with him, because he, he said, I done heard this many times. I did this. And here he is in his 80s and still coming up, up in church because he realizes that what it means. Paul said, it's better for you that I say, it's better for me if I go. He knows that. But it's more important for you that I say, if he left us, we'd feel crippled somewhat and awkward. And they, he will go. And so, will, so will Clarice. I will go. We'll all go. But as long as we're here, we must live out our function and find our destiny and our purpose. Live it loudly. Live it boldly and live it unapologetically. You have nothing to be sorry about. Turn to somebody and say, I am who I am. You don't even have to ask me what my name is. That's just a title. I am. That's what God said, who I am. And when Moses said, well, who is that? I am that I am. You don't have to know. I don't, the title don't mean it doesn't mean anything. I am. That's a powerful statement. I am. I exist. Somebody asked me, am I happy? And I couldn't say yes or no. I don't say that yes or no anymore. I don't know that I'm happy. I'm just happening. I'm occurring. I'm here. I exist. I'm me. I am me. I'm in the current. I am current. I'm in the flow. I create the flow. I am fluid. My, my. We're 100,000 my, 100, miles of veins and arteries vamping and pulsing through those are salt water or blood. And so we are 80% water. When we, when we come out of our mother's womb, we're 80% water. By the time we're adults, we're around 60% water. But the lungs and brain remains 80% water. 
So if somebody call you waterhead, take it as a compliment, you are alive. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. 92% if you consider all the moisture in leaves and even in a rock. Everything is full of moisture. You full of moisture. And spirit, water is a metaphor for spirit. You have a mind, you have a body, but you are spirit. Not a spirit, just spirit. Just essence. You just am. You just is. You just are. <laughs> And when, when nothing else makes sense, just say, I am. You don't have to follow it because you got to be careful following it and say, I'm tired. I'm confused. I, just say, I am and stop. You have to say, I'm male and female. I'm pretty, I'm ugly, I'm rich. I'm just say, I am. That's enough. I am is enough. Turn to someone and say, I am is enough. You are enough. You were weak on that one. If you don't remember anything else, I say, remember this. Don't just love yourself, because you do that automatically. Like yourself, that takes work. Most of us do not like ourselves. We're not taught to like ourselves. Most of us don't even think our parents like us, or our siblings like us, or our spouses, and sometimes our children. We know they love us. Most of us don't have a question about love. Love is automatically. I've never heard a sermon in my life where anybody even suggested that God liked me. Because if you say, I like you, that you usually interpret that as meaning you don't need to improve, that you, you're where you ought to be, which it, in one sense, that's absolutely, one sense that's absolutely true, in another sense, it isn't. People are afraid to say, I tell single people, don't just marry somebody you love, marry somebody you like. Because there's a lot of people you love that you don't want to live with. Starting with mom and them, maybe. <laughs> and the children. We, haven't, we need to learn, everybody says, people need to learn to love. You don't learn to love, you forget to love. You learn to hate. We come here loving, trusting, believing, and knowing that we're okay. You know you're all right. You just don't believe it. You know you're good. <laughs> you just don't believe it. You know you're rich and healthy and secure, but somebody taught you not to believe that. So the conflict in you is what your soul and cells know and what your mind believes. How do you rectify that? I'm going through that more now in my 60s than I ever did in my in earlier than years. I just believe everything. I wasn't about knowing. But knowledge begins to manifest and expand and, ex and extend itself as you mature. And uh, as you grow in consciousness, you start knowing more than you believe. You've heard me say we come here knowing in between the womb and the tomb. We tend to go through the spiritual amnesia and forget what we know and start believing what we're told. And that's what gets us screwed up. Pay attention to your soul. Walk in sync with your soul, in cadence with your spirit, not decadence. Dec don't die in what you know. Live by what you know. Turn to someone and say, I'm alive and well, and the best is yet to come. Is yet to come. Life is about living and surviving the process of dying. Somebody say, how are you doing? They usually mean, how are you dying? Because from the time you come out of your mother's womb, you're headed toward that place that we call death, which is the transition to your next iteration. Turn to someone and say, how are you dying this morning? <laughs> and they might say, I, oh, I'm, I'm dying pretty good. <laughs> or they might say, I ain't dying so good today. I got COVID. <laughs> I ain't dying so good, I got a headache. We're all going through that evolutional process. Now, let me just give you a couple of quotes. Dalai Lama says, the purpose of our lives is to be happy. I made reference to what I feel about that. Or really, the purpose of life is to be happening. It's to be a current, occurring and current. The purpose of life is existence and expansion, not expulsion. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm, 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 I'm occurring, I'm, I'm current. John Lemon says, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. You're alive. You only live once, Mae West, but if you do it right, once is enough. <laughs> I love that, it was one of my favorite ones. 
Get busy living or get busy dying. Stephen King, get busy living or get busy dying. I'm dying okay today. I'm not afraid of death. Sometimes we're more afraid of life than we are. We're not afraid of death. We're just afraid of dying, which means we're afraid of living. People are uncomfortable about living. What made Bishop Earl Park relatable and attractive to me is he remained in touch with life. The founder had an, an awareness of life, and he forced himself to move away from the things that had him clenched down from their impoverished. They were poor children. They were poor people here in Georgia. They did, most Pentecostals were not bright and intellectual. And, I mean, we'll have a scholar. We have a scholar here. We have an academician. We have a man that thinks. But they were born in the, the whole Park family. They, and most Pentecostals that I know, especially from the South, were not the brightest people on the planet. Classical Pentecostal was psychotic most of the time. Man, I know I grew up in psychosis. I know y'all know, what you mean? You was crazy, you was crazy like, like, like we all are. <laughs> Remember psychologists say one out, one out of five people you meet on the street are mentally ill? That's what they say. Count five down the road. That fifth one, they're struggling. <laughs> and if you count back the other direction, you're going to be the one. That's... So dentists get cavities. Talk to me, somebody. Oncologists die of cancer. Cardiologists have heart attacks. We're not perfect. We're not... We're not beautiful little crystal clear china that, that somebody has in a china cabinet just so you can know they got it, because they rarely use it. The reason they're so perfect is they're never used. But when you're used, you got some scars and cracks and chips. Most of us around here are mugs. We're not china, we're not teacups, and we're not crystal. We are mug with some chips and stains and cracks, and you can't even tell where we came from, smudges. We, 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 may not be, we may not be the most attractive, but we can hold the water. Talk to me, somebody. I never use the, the fancy stuff in my house. I don't even want to use it. I ain't even going to put it out of you. Come out and show you. I got some over there, but you ain't going to get none of it. I might give you a plastic plate to eat, but just sit down. Because I want something that doesn't break so easily. I need somebody that'll last that's been kicked around and hit and slapped and cut. Mother, mother, um, mother Wendy could tell a story of mine. She could, she could have given the message today. Her story must be amazing. Children, her grandchildren, her great grands her parents, at her age, ain't nobody she knows still alive. <laughs> I mean, not nobody she grew up, she done outlived everybody. When you live that long, my mother says to me all the time, uh, well, do we have any relatives left? In she has to, I have to tell her the same thing every time. Who, I went to Phoenix a few weeks ago, a few months ago. I've been there two or three times because I do some TV work out there. And sh she said, to, so you went to Tucson? I said, no, Mom, Phoenix. Oh, well, well oh, my people, because her great, great grandma, her grandmother, her mother-in-law lived there. No, her grandmother lived there, my great grandmother. And a lot of them came from Texas to Tucson and then to San Diego. My mother used to wake up in the morning to the sound of seagulls because her mother cleaned houses in La Jolla. Uh, and they lived in, she was a live-in maid in La Jolla, California and the richest community in my area. I always told myself when I retire, that's where, I, where, that's where I'm gonna live, in La Jolla. It's right, right there looking at the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Pacifica, peace is, is the word uh, in, in Latin, Pacifica. So uh, I love that water, I love the waves, but I never liked it at night, it's very depressing. I always like to sit, be, live where I could see the skyline and the ocean, because at night, the ocean seems so deep and dark and black and frightening. But in the daytime, uh, you can see the waves, but then there's always storms, and there's, not always, but there's always the possibility of storms. But moisture and water, thousands and thousands and thousands and millions and billions of gallons of water, and we're all part of that moisture. We're all part of the flow. When I talk about fluidity and being in the current, we're all part of the current. Say it, I am part of the current. Say it. I create my own current. I create my own water. Jesus turned water into wine. Did he not, according to Scripture? We turn wine into water. It's called pee. All right, God bless you. Too. I'm, I'm almost through. You can fix this. <laughs> uh, that, God showed me that in a dream. <laughs> All right, let me, let me, I want to get to this part. 
All living things grow, all growing things change, and all change is a struggle. We must all make the change, manage the change, master the change. Be willing to make the shift when, where, and however necessary, starting first with attitude. Be willing to make the shift. Be willing to create the shift. If you don't remember anything else I say today, remain, remember this, remain curious, remain adaptable, and brace for change, seen and unseen, all the variables connected with change. The old is dying and diminishing before our very eyes. The new is bold and unapologetic. It does not consider the past as an obstacle or a hindrance or an obstruction because both the new and the old know their time has come. Old knows it's old. New knows it's new. They don't oppose each other. The old knows it. Some are holding on to the old, white knuckle trying to keep it dead. That's what you saw on January 6th in, in D.C., holding on to the old. You don't have to like the change. You can resent it, but if you resist it, you will lose because change is imminent. Change is prominent. Change is now. Change is you and I together. We are that change. I open, oh, open your arms like this and say, I accept the change. Come on, pull it in. Thank you for the change. Thank you for the charge. Thank you for the challenge. The things that Dee reminded him of when he was introducing me, I, I, I was, I didn't, my children like Esther, my son got to be, I don't even, I didn't pay attention how long I've been, so I'm about this up. My son was a, Julian was a, uh, uh, production assistant when they shot the movie down here. And so he was here the whole 30 days. And they gave him a special seat on the different sets in the city all day. And uh, he said to me, Daddy, I had no idea. Because I didn't tell them that story. I never let them know. Because they were, they were tiny. I didn't want them to experience the drama or trauma that Gene and I, my family, and the others did. So Julian didn't really know till he saw. And now I have to help because I got bitter about church folks. He thought they were inconsistent and he has a little bit of an attitude. Um, I remember I was sitting there one time watching right here in Atlanta, watching the scene where the people started shouting at me and got, they, they over-dramatized it, but it did occur uh, and they would get up and walk out of the church. You can't rewrite the Bible. When I say I don't, I'm not trying to rewrite it, I'm just rereading it. And uh, it was so painful, my emotions were so raw. I thought, God, I gotta get out of here because I'm gonna cry and I'm not gonna cry in front of these people. The room was full of all the actors and the folks that sat there as part of the church. I was really uncomfortable, so I was trying to figure a, place, a way to get out. And uh, when the attention wouldn't be on me, and I saw a door, and I, I, I went toward the door, and there my boy was, my son was standing there with his arms outstretched like this. He'd been watching me that whole time. He just gathered me up into his arms, and we stood there and wept together. I said, get me out, son, into the hallway quickly. He pulled me out so people wouldn't see. He said, I didn't know it was that bad, Dad. I said, son, it's, it's just part of my destiny. It's part of what we went through. Why didn't you tell me? I said, well, you were too young for me to tell you all that. Don't get an attitude about it. He struggles to this day, trusting church folk. Nobody is mean as church folk. And they mean because they're mad. <laughs> and they're mad because they think God is. You can no more offend God that you can offend when, but I know you know that, but you don't believe it. Your God, the real God, is too big and broad to get his feelings hurt because of something you do, because you looked at somebody wrong. It might offend you, it might affect you, but it doesn't affect God. You're not powerful enough to affect God. We got to stop worshiping God, a God with anger management issues that throws tantrums in pandemics. This, this pandemic ain't got nothing to do with God's judgment. It's biological and psychological warfare that people have created. We're going through a change. You're going through a shift. Wrap your arms around yourself once again like this. Spirit and truth recognize this. You are probably the most unique, <clears throat> particular body. D.E. coined the phrase, the phrase metacostal. 
I've used it all over the planet now, and people love it. We are now starting and launching a metacostal network called Streaming Consciousness, where we'll have our own channel on it. The gentleman that, that uh, almost owns the patent on Wi-Fi, a man of color, has come to me and asked me about it. Because this kind of ministry has narrow, uh, the, the expanded consciousness group, the Michael Beckwith, the Marianne Williams, and some of those have narrow casted instead of broadcasting because we've allowed fundamentalism to dominate the media. And while I have been a fundamentalist all my life, I realize that I'm not, Jesus said, or the writer of Hebrews said, go beyond the teachings of Christ. He didn't say abandon them, just move beyond them to spiritual perfection. When we say spirit and truth, we're talking about matured believers. Perfect love just means adult love. Full grown love casts out fear because fear has torment. We, we're getting beyond being afraid of who we are or who we're not. We're getting comfortable with who we are. Playing softly, please, as we bring this too close. We, we, we're, we're getting to the place where we're, we're becoming less apologetic. I want you at spirit in truth to understand you're not a normal church not even a natural one you are a unique gathering of people and the founder where he's still here would have expanded to the same place that de is and brandy is and that his supportive parents are and you a couple that's been here 50 years god bless you you had to pay a price. You had to endure what we endured. We salute you. And those who've been here for uh, various amounts of time <clears throat> through the shifts in transition, we're not through transitioning. We're not through changing. Every time I talk to D.E., he has another thought. He's expanding more. He's got several books in him. He keeps studying. He has all kinds of books that he's reading books that he's writing and your support is invaluable and it's also an assignment when we ask you to support the ministry with your presence p-r-e-s-e-n-c and p-r-e-s-e-n-t-s you're giving this isn't a normal natural thing and it's going to be on the network this church will have its own program on the channel and it will be global the network will be as large as these other ones that you hear, like Amazon and, and Google, because this guy's a genius. The man that's founded this created the app that when you go into a restaurant and put your phone up to a, a menu, the menu comes on your phone. He created that app. He created the app where you can, those of you who know how to, and I don't, put your YouTube on your television. He created that app. He's only 50 years old. He was born in Louisiana and made in China. Look him up, Lael Alexander, L-A-E-L -E Alexander. He's a, the embodiment of the new Black Wall Street, in my opinion. He's a genius. I've never met anybody like him in my life. I'll be meeting with him tomorrow in San Diego, in Tulsa. Again, he saw me on the Roland Martin show. He said, I'm going to give you a channel. I'm going to give you a channel. Since then, he says, no, what do you want to name it? I said, streaming consciousness. He said, well, just make it a network. I'll name the whole network that. So I start calling expanded people saying, let's do this, let's, let's bring in the metacostalism. That's very powerful. Do you like the shake yesterday and last week and last month off? Move your body around. Now get those hands up, surrender to the now. Say, thank God for the now and for the new that I am, that I embrace, that I celebrate, that I rejoice in unapologetically. We're on our way to that wealthy place. Oh, glory to God. Clap your hands. All you people, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Come on, let's stand and give Bishop Pearson the love that he deserves. Thank you, Bishop. Wow, 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 wow. Anybody glad that there's just a breath of fresh air that blows through this place occasionally named Carlton Pearson? <laughs> Always light, always love, always health, always of sound mind. Yeah. You know, re religion, as he said rightly this morning, is a psychosis. People get caught up into that, into that hate, into that separation. Our job is not to get you saved, it's to remind you that you have been saved. 
you have been reconciled to God in Christ Jesus, our job is not to be saved, it's to feel safe. A lot of us are saved, but we don't feel safe with God. And so in this house, you are safe. Bishop said it this morning, this is a sanctuary. It is a safe haven for all of God's children. We want to continue to make sure that it, it remains that way. I ask all of our members to bring something special on our anniversary today. We are in a, a recovery process. Uh, those who had not been as consistent in their giving, they are, they are finding that discipline and that, uh, that joy, that commitment level. We give thanks for that. I, I believe, and I've, I'll, I'll just be candid with you, I don't do a, lo a lot of ego. I'm, I, I try to walk with a level of humility. Uh, I don't, Bishop and I were talking last night about some of the people that we've had in our pulpits that um, we don't care for on a, on a, um, uh, outside of the pulpit. Great in the pulpit, privately, we, we, I'll pass, amen. <laughs> keep, on, keep, keep on stepping and get the hell on somewhere else, amen. Um, but when you, find, when you find a level of humility, you realize the world does not revolve around me, okay, even though it's created within me that I'm not the center of the universe. I'm just a piece. I'm just, I'm just a light. And so what we are trying to um, manifest at Spirit and Truth Sanctuary is to just be a model. We are a model that black and white can worship together, gay and straight, that Christian and Jew and Hindu and Buddhist and even athe atheist and agnostic, that we can all not just coexist, but celebrate that we have one mind, one spirit, one human family. I believe it's something that is, that is worth uh, existing, something that's worth supporting. I asked everybody to bring something special today, hopefully at least $61 for 61 years of ministry as a special offering. Brandy and I have decided to bring $610. I know there's somebody out there who wants to give $610,000. Bishop told me this morning that, uh, that God spoke a word to him, that someone was going to give $610,000 today. <laughs> Y'all are looking at me like, are you serious? Are you really serious about this? Y'all been in church too long. Luckily, is he really going there? Of course I'm not. I want you to give what you can today. And uh, give, give with a, a spirit of joy. Give knowing that this ministry will continue to survive in our hearts and our minds. And give knowing that hopefully we are establishing something that years from now, your grandchildren can walk into this place and feel embraced, feel affirmed, feel safe, feel connected to God, that there is no separation between God and man. Knowing that the good work God began in us, God will see it to the day of completion. I, can, I usually come every Sunday with my text to give. Uh, I give through, um, through PayPal. I came just old school with a check today. I'm just going to bring it old school just to, just to honor the house today. Whatever you brought today, I'll ask you if you hold it up with us. Come on, let's give in a spirit of joy. God, we thank you for 61 years. Whether we're given $61, $610, more or less than that, God, we pray that it's all brought together with a spirit of joy, knowing that there is both vision and provision in the house, that solution already exists. God, we thank you for new and open doors, for moments of enlightenment and awakening. God, we thank you that what, what you do, you do it always well. For it's in the name and nature of the Christ we pray. Can you say amen? Amen. Be seated as you give today.
Come on, let's stand be dismissed together today. How many of you are glad that you're made in God's image? Made me just like him? Yeah, thank you, God, that we know that we're made in the image and likeness of God and of good. As we are dismissed today, we want to say again, happy anniversary to everybody. Happy 61 years. Celebrate that somehow, especially today. And uh, as, uh, as we give the dismissing prayer, we're going to uh, be dismissed today uh, with the song Stand By Me, one of my favorite gospel songs. And so stick around if you'd like to hear that. God, we thank you for this amazing day. We thank you for this word that is feeding our spirits. We thank you for 61 years in our past and 61 years in our future. We thank you, God, that your sustaining grace has walked with us the whole way. May this be a week of power and of open doors, of favor and insight. For the name and nature of the Christ, we pray they all would say amen. Happy anniversary. Go in peace. We love you, spirit and truth.